Now that we've computed one integral by a Riemann sum, we probably want to know how can we do future integrals without computing a Riemann sum. So let's remind ourselves of the definition of the Riemann sum. So the double integral over a rectangle R, rectangular region R, f of x, y, dA. This was given to us, uh, we, were, we worked out that this is given by a Riemann sum. Really it's a double Riemann sum. The sum i goes from 1 to n, limit as n goes to, to infinity of the limit m goes to infinity, sum j goes from 1 to m of our function. We can break this up into xij i star yj star times delta y sub j times delta x sub i. Okay. And if we do this, we notice that this inner Riemann sum, this is how we computed it in the last example, this Riemann sum is actually just an integral in the usual Calc 1 sense, an integral with respect to y. And so if our rectangular region here is a comma b cross c comma d, then the c, d are the limits in the y direction. This whole thing can be written as a limit n approaches infinity, sum i from 1 to n of, well, what's, what's, what's inside here now? This can just be written in terms of the Calc 1 integral, the limit from, or sorry, the integral from c to d of f of x i star comma y dy, delta x i. So this is just a Calc 1 integral with respect to y. You treat the x like it's a constant, and whatever happens, happens. But the y will be integrated out. It'll no longer be there. There'll be numbers there. C and D are numbers in this case. And then we notice that the resulting Riemann sum is a Calc 1 integral in respect to x. Right, so the integrand here, this is this whole thing is a function of xi star. The y's are all integrated out; they're just numbers, so they're treated like constants as well. And so this integral can be written, or this limit can be written as the integral from a to b of the integrand, which is now integral from c to d, f of xy, replace xi star with x, dy, and then dx. Okay, and usually in, at this point we drop these brackets, although the bra brackets are very, very useful here, very illustrative, because they tell us to integrate the inside first and then the outside, but frequently these are dropped, and we just write integral from A to B of the integral from C to D, f of xy dy dx. Okay, and so this original integral, the integral of f of x, y, d, a over the region r can be written instead as this integral, which is a double integral, two calc 1 integrals kind of nested inside of each other, and this is called an iterated integral. So an iterated integral, and this is where the brackets actually, you don't want to completely ignore them. Even if you don't write them the first time, when you go to compute, it's useful to put them back because the iteration here tells you to do the inside first and then move to the outside integral once you're done. But each one of these integrals that are just with respect to dy or dx, these are called partial integrals, and they behave just like partial derivatives do, and that when you take an integral with respect to y, you treat x like it's a constant. And the same thing, if, if x was the integral, the integral variable, you would treat every other variable like a constant, unless they depend on x, of course, but x and y are independent here. Okay, so this is an iterated integral, and this will allow us to compute our double integrals over rectangular regions. It's very important that this is a rectangle. Over rectangular regions without actually having to do the Riemann sum, uh, we can just do iterated integrals. And so there's a very important theorem that I want to tell you. Um, and it basically, we're not going to write the whole proof of it, but the basic idea is that this, the order that I wrote this double sum up here can be that was a choice I made. It could be reversed. So I could take these delta x's, delta xi inside, and this sum inside here, and I can reverse the order of the summation without changing anything, because you can always change the order that you add up finitely many things. Hopefully the limits behave properly here. And so um, changing the order of these limits is essentially changing the order of these double integrals. 
And so this leads us to a theorem. And this theorem is very important. It has a name. So this theorem is called Fubini's theorem. It's due to a mathematician named Fubini. And so here's what this theorem says. So let's let f be a continuous function on a rectangle R. So I'll just write out the bounds of the rectangle. So AB in the x direction, CD in the y direction. So it's a con continuous function on this product, this rectangular region, um, AB cross CD. <clears throat> then the double integral of this function over R, f of x, y, dA. This can be computed as the iterated integral that we just wrote down. Integral from a to b, then the integral, sorry, the integral from c to d on the inside with respect to y, then the integral with respect to x on the outside. Or it can be computed as the integral from a to b of f of x, y, dx first, and then that's on the inside, then on the outside, integral from c to d, dy. Okay, so Fubini's theorem tells us that we can change, essentially change the order of integration, but you can't forget to also change the limits when you do so. Okay, now here's some no, some words of caution. Fubini's theorem only applies, number one, when the function, the integrand is continuous, and number two, the second thing that we need to check and make sure of is that the region has to be a rectangle. So the region that we're integrating over must be a rectangle. And when this region is not a rectangle, we'll see that we have to be extremely careful 